All right, so everybody now should uh, see the screen that says transition the beginning. Also, just so you know, at, at the end of the presentation, if we have enough time, which hopefully we will or we may not, um, I have something else I want to show you that's not part of uh, the PowerPoint, but it's uh, some real life stuff in terms of what we do with drone technology when it comes with transitions these days. So uh, with that said, let, let's get going. Uh, today, like I said, is about transition. And you can see we call it the beginning. And again, my name is Mitch Frumkin. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself. That's one of the better pictures of me. And um, uh, from the transition perspective, as most of you know, I've been very involved in CAI over the years and still am very involved in CAI. And um, when CAI developed the best practices paper on transition, I chaired that um, national task force that did that. And that uh, best practice paper on transition was put together between CAI nationally, as well as the National Association of Home Builders. That goes back about, I guess, about uh, 10 years at least from already. Um, and <laughs> about three or four years ago, CAI uh, approached me about chairing a national task force to update that paper on transition, the best practices paper, which was done and released. And I'll show it to you at the end of the seminar, but if anybody would like to copy that best practices report, on transition, um, it's no problem. We'll email that to you, or if you go to the CAI national website, you can get a copy of that. There, there is no charge for it. Um, one of the things that came out of the uh, best practices paper was that CAI offers a national course, which this day is done. These days is done by webinar like this, and we generally have a very uh, big turnout from across the country. It's called M three seventy, managing developing communities, which is based on that best practices report. In addition to that, as we'll talk about, uh, reserves or uh, reserve funding and reserve studies are a big connection to this. And uh, CAI has a, um, a national standard on reserve studies, which was just recently updated. And one of the things just when it relates to transition that was added just a few years ago is a new level of service within the reserve study standards about four or five years ago called the preliminary study, which we'll talk about today part of today's presentation. That um, reserve study standard was just updated again in the last few months. And if anybody would like a copy of it, I was co-chair of the committee that changed, that updated it. The reason for updating it was because of CAI coming out with their public policy in regards to condominium safety uh, based on the tragic collapse that took place in Florida. And uh, it was very clear that there's a connection between reserve funding, maintenance, and structural inspections. So the reserve study standards was updated to reflect the connection between those. Uh, the other thing that came out of that as it relates to transition, which we'll touch on, is uh, I think most of the people here are from New Jersey, but I think there may be some people from other states also. But in New Jersey, legislatively, the, there are going to be most likely some changes and some of those changes will affect the developer responsibility prior to turnover, which is something that will be discussed as part of transition or become part of transition. So there's a lot of things, real time things going on right now in the industry as a result of the tragic collapse in Florida, which has resulted in some, um, you know, I hate to put it that way, but added, because of that tragic collapse, there's been a number of changes in our industry that are ongoing right now. And some of them do affect transition. Uh, joining me today, uh, Melissa, do you want to introduce yourself or do you want me to introduce you? I'll introduce myself. Um, <clears throat> I'm manager of engineering with KIPCON. I don't have quite as many bullet points as Mitch does, uh, but I have about 35 years experience in the industry. I started out in design um, of, of uh, site work, and I had done that for um, many years before joining KIPCON. So um, I have a lot of experience on that end of it, which helps me on the transition end in um, taking a look at uh, what is supposed to be constructed and, and making comparisons. And we'll talk about that a little later. Um, that I'm a licensed professional engineer and also a reserve specialist. So um, those are uh, some major components of uh, uh, the transition study. Um, you know, taking a look at plans and, and doing the comparison and also the reserve component of uh, transition. So um, I've done uh, quite a few transitions uh, here at KIPCON and um, I probably do many more. <laughs> so I'll turn it back over to Mitch. 
Thanks. And as I mentioned before, there are some other absolute experts in the audience today. We have George Gattrell. I don't know if George, if I pronounce your name right, but George is with Hill Wallach, and he's involved in a lot of transitions. Uh, we also have, I see in here, let me go down the list, where Marshall Grainer is here. I know we've worked on a number of transitions with Marshall, and he may have some comments. And I, I don't want to miss anybody, but if anybody has any that has some expertise in the audience, feel free to jump in and to like I said before, and to correct me and Melissa. So um, what we're going to be talking about today is there's a number of discussion topics. Uh, first, we'll talk about exactly what transition is. We're going to talk about some key concepts. What are the risks of transition? What are the expectations? And I have to say that expectations, whenever we teach courses on transition or the M370 from CAI, one of the biggest problems we run into sometimes is people's expectations of what they should be getting as part of this process. And unfortunately, in some instances, people are looking for perfection and it, it doesn't really exist. But expectations is one of the biggest words to me in terms of um, the transition process. Claims evaluation, we're gonna talk about uh, some of the dangers and some cutting edge strategies that are being employed these days as part of the transition process. Uh, those are the topics we're gonna be talking about, but let's start about what is transition? And um, the reason why it's important to understand this is a lot of people think transition is a point in time where the community takes over control of the development from the developer. But there's two terms you have to understand. For example, transition is a process. The transition process starts when the developer decides to build a community association and the transition process ends when the developer is gone and the community is in charge of itself essentially. When the community actually takes control is the point in time called turnover. So keep in mind that uh, transition is a process, turnover is the point in time. And uh, I may be jumping ahead once in a while, but if those of you who heard me speak, you know, I go all over the place. But that, uh, that turnover point generally takes place when 75% of the units are, are, uh, are closed. But the reason I say that is because a lot of people in conversation use the word transition as a point in time when the association takes control. But keep in mind, it's a process. That process of transition can take years, but the turnover point is a point in time when the association takes control. And there's four different parts of the uh, phases of transition. There's the document development, which we'll touch on, construction, uh, turnover, which is what I just said, and the, then you become an independent, independent community. So there's four different phases. Um, the transition process evolved from the development of community associations. Remember, well, at least I can remember back in the day, because uh, in the mid 70s is when uh, community associations really took control in this country. Back in the mid 70s or early 70s, there were only about 10,000 community associations across the country. It has exponentially expanded where right now it's estimated um, that there's probably 350,000 community associations across the country. And um, in New Jersey, in this part of the country, I would say about 100% of what's being built is being built as some type of community association. But across the country, it's estimated that probably 60 to 70% of residential housing is being built as some type of community association. So there's 335, 340,000 associations across the country now, but it, it keeps on getting larger and larger. The process of transition is that is the turnover. Now, uh, Keep in mind, I always tell the story that uh, back when we used to, when people bought single family houses that weren't part, weren't part of an association, what would they do? They'd pick out the house they want, they'd go inspect it, they'd see if there's any problems, and then they would make an offer, negotiate, and then they would buy it. The big difference in terms of associations is that you don't do the inspection to look at it to see if it was built right and to negotiate until after you've already bought into the community and that's the turnover process. But that is a totally different paradigm from when you buy a single family or a house that's not part of an association. But the purpose of the transition is to provide a mechanism for the developer or the sponsor to turn over the community to the new homeowners. But that's kind of the history. It evolved with community associations. That's obviously where it comes from. So here's the first phase. The first phase is the document development. In the first phase, it's the legal creation of the community association. It's not built, doesn't exist, but it's taking an idea that the developer has and turn creates the legal documents which create the association. 
It includes things such as the master deed, the bylaws, the budget, the design drawings, but all these things take place during the document development phase. In New Jersey, there are very specific statutory requirements in regards to what goes into these documents and the disclosure documents. And uh, But that's phase one, the document development. It has not even been built yet. I will mention one of the things we're going to talk about is that there's a budget included in those documents. Right now, the statutory requirement in New Jersey is that as part of that budget, there should be adequate reserves included. Up until about five or six years ago, or maybe a little longer than that, the definition of adequate did not exist. And that was where there was some contention taking place during the uh, turnover process of what does it really mean to have adequate reserves. That was then clarified with some changing to regulations where uh, adequacy is now clearly defined in the statutory requirements. There were meetings between CAI, uh, the Builders Association in New Jersey, and, um, and the Department of Community Affairs where that definition was derived. And I think, um, you know, I think George may have been as part of that committee. I was on that committee a number of years ago. Right now, there are some more changes that are taking place in Senate Bill 2760 having to do with structural integrity. But it also talks in there about, uh, as I mentioned before, the importance of maintenance, where assuming this passes, it's going to also require the developer not only to include adequate reserves in the governing documents, but also to include a maintenance plan. A maintenance plan that says how the community should be maintained, preventive maintenance, which is all other seminar or webinar, how it should be maintained, as well as the budget for it. So the other thing that will change for associations after turnover, just to go off track just for a second, is that um, after turnover to the association, the associations will be required to have reserve studies and to fund them adequately, which is, again, it's a whole other webinar, but I just wanted to show you some of the things that are happening in real time right now. And I think you're gonna see some of these changes uh, be approved uh, in the next, and the latest the next year from now. So that's the phase one, the document development. Then the next one is a uh, phase two. What do you think that is? Now you build the community. That's when building the community takes place. Now, uh, pretty clear. I mean, I, everybody understands what that is. Now we've taken the, the documents, such as the architectural plans and the engineering plans, and the community is actually being built, hopefully to come pretty close to matching those, which is something we'll talk about as part of the seminar, this webinar, but that's the phase two building. Phase three is turnover. That's the point in time when the homeowners, the new homeowners take control. And as I mentioned before, that typically... Uh, takes place when 75% of the homes have been sold, but that's the turnover point. And then the last one, phase four, is it's an independent community, which means that the developer's gone and the homeowners have control. I do have to mention that what's the developer's role in this thing? You know, because a lot of people look at the developer and say that they're the bad guys. The developer has a couple of goals. They want to make money. Let's not kid ourselves. They're in business to make money. And they're in business not to build it wrong, not to get into disputes through, because of transition and the type of things we're going to talk about. But there's nothing that would make a developer happier than to build a community, have hundreds of people move into it, and everybody be happy so that those hundreds of people become salespeople for that developer and tell them what a beautiful community it is and you should buy in one of their communities. So that's the goal of developers. And I've given this seminar or webinar a number of times with developers and they all say the same thing let's not kid ourselves they're here to make money but they're not here to build it wrong and i've never met anybody who builds it wrong on purpose so um but developers like to get out too so they can move on to the next community by making a profit and having happy homeowners so with that said that's phase four and let's see now i'm going to turn it over to melissa starting with the key concepts okay all right, so let's go through a couple of key concepts before we uh, talk about <clears throat> transition. Um, and go ahead, Mitch, and advance the slides as, as, as you think it's appropriate. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the governing documents uh, define the common and limited common elements for a community. So the general common elements are um, those uh, elements within the community that, that are um, for the use by everyone who lives there. Just for example, it might be um, a park area or, or some roadways or some open space 
Um, and it's it's uh, there's there's a benefit uh, for for all the owners, and it's a responsible. Uh, the association is responsible for the maintenance and for replacement of those common element components. Limited common elements are those that are um, used uh, for the use of uh, one or more unit owners, but not all individual unit owners. So sometimes that could be, um, as you see in the picture here, a garage area or a, or a balcony, or perhaps there's a common um, uh, entryway uh, to several units. So it, you have to look at the governing documents, but Oftentimes, the association is responsible not only to maintain a limited common element, but uh, sometimes is also um, responsible to replace a limited common element when it's reached the end of its useful life. Oh, next one, Mitch. So uh, Mitch touched on this earlier. Um, I guess uh, it, for community associations, there, uh, it's 24% of all residential homes and 80% of all new homes. Um, and throughout the US, um, there's uh, approximately 342,000 community associations. So it is a, a segment of residential housing that is growing very quickly. Next slide. So there are different types of community associations, and uh, it, it depends on the type of buildings and the type of ownership. Um, that's, again, spelled out in the governing documents. So condominiums, for example, might be um, in several different buildings where, where the buildings are multi-unit buildings. Sometimes they are uh, stacked units. Sometimes they're side by side or staggered units throughout the building. Uh, but in a condominium form of ownership, uh, the the unit owner typically owns um, from from the walls in or or some sort of combination of that. With a homeowners association, there are oftentimes uh, lots that are that the the unit owners uh, purchase and they own what's on the lot and they're responsible for what's on the lot. And the common elements are or things in the limited common elements are sometimes things outside of those lot areas. In the case of a, uh, of a condominium, um, the common elements uh, may also include um, some of the uh, uh, building envelope components like, like uh, stone veneer or roofing or, um, or vinyl siding. Oftentimes with a homeowners association, not always, but oftentimes with a homeowners association, the unit owner might be responsible for the building. Um, and, and not the association. There may be a clubhouse that's common to everyone, and which is a common element in recreational facilities that are common elements. And then there are some communities that are, are mixed use. I, I see uh, these quite often in Pennsylvania, where there's a mixture of condominium or townhome and, or, and, and individual homeowner lots on the same site. So it's, it's different types of ownership contained within the, within the same site. And again, the governing documents uh, spell out uh, who is responsible for, for what elements in the community in, in all these different types of communities. Uh, next slide. Yeah, I just wanted to comment also that um, sometimes you see mixed use communities that are not just residential, it's a combination of residential with some commercial things in the community also, so that that could fall under the mixed use. Yes, that, that's true. I see a lot of development now, especially in more urban areas where there's a commercial use on, on the bottom uh, story or two, and then the upper stories are residential units. And then those can get pretty interesting also because sometimes when you're doing the inspection of the common elements, you have, may have the commercial space on the bottom and all the res residential units up above, but the common elements may include the structure that goes through the commercial that supports the residential. And in many cases, the commercial spot is actually one of the units of the condo. So there's all kinds of different uh, configurations in terms of ownership when you start getting involved with mixed use with commercial and residential. Right. That's why it's really important to, to read through the governing documents and understand what's common and what's limited common um, in terms of the residential portion. Uh, so another important element of what happens during uh, turnover is the preparation of um, a reserve study. But the reserve study uh, actually has its origins 
Um, in the um, in the document uh, preparation, uh, Mitch talked about the different stages. And stage one is document development. Um, during during that stage, um, you know that you've got the design plans. You're in the the governing documents are being formulated, and oftentimes within those governing documents is a um, is an initial um, reserve statement. And since the community isn't constructed yet, that reserve statement is based on, um, you know, the the, um, uh, the development plan. So uh, oftentimes, though, as a community is uh, before a community is constructed, or oftentimes during construction of a community, there might be changes to those to those uh, approved design plans. In which case, the reserve statement should be updated to reflect those changes. Sometimes it is, sometimes it is not. So uh, that's why during uh, the transition process, we take a look, we take a backwards look uh, at those, at that reserve statement in the governing documents. So that would be um, the 0.01 at the top there. So that primary study, that initial reserve statement based on the design is, would appear in your governing documents. Uh, during turnover, uh, when at the time we would perhaps do a transition study, you would have a full reserve study done. So it, that reserve study is based on our actual observations and what is actually constructed at the site. So that's the difference between the full reserve study and that preliminary study. One is based on uh, a, a design plan of something that's unconstructed. The full study during transition is based on the actual construction. So oftentimes what we'll do during the transition, you have the option of having us take a backward look at that primary study to see if it is apples to apples, so to speak, that all of the elements that are constructed have been included in that preliminary study and that in, in, in dollar terms of the year that those documents were prepared that it's um that it's adequate so so when you have that reserve study prepared during transition although that is a study for your budgetary purposes at that time we also use it as the basis for that backward look so then after turnover um it doesn't end there you're going to take that full study and every three to five years you're going to have uh, that study update, we always recommend three years, uh, you're going to take that study and you're going to have it updated so that it's reflecting the current condition of the common elements and uh, the, the current pricing to have those common elements replaced as the community ages. Okay, next slide. Yeah, I just want to uh, add to that. As I, I mentioned before, there's some changes. So for example, if these new changes come to place in New Jersey, then there's going to be another slide here. One of the key concepts is going to be maintenance plan and what that is. The other thing is that in certain states, and New Jersey's one of them, uh, there were in the last few years some requirements put in in regard to the developer updating the reserve study at the end of construction to match what was actually built. So some of the onus for doing this type of thing has been pushed back on the developer in, uh, at the end of construction, which hopefully also will minimize um, some of the claims that take place for underfunding reserves as part of the transition process. So th there's definitely some things going on with this and things that have been done uh, to minimize the type of claims that have been happening as part of this process. Okay, so during transition, there are, you would, the community association would have a team of professionals as as Mitch mentioned, so that would include uh, their their transition engineer, um, their attorney, um, and then the developer also has a, a team of individuals that um, that they work with. They also have their own engineer, and pictured here is the developer's engineer. So what the developer's engineer has done is um, design the community. Sometimes some developers have uh, design teams in house. Uh, that they use. Sometimes they use an outside engineering firm um, to prepare the plans, but but the developer's engineer is is typically the engineer um, the engineers that they use to um, design the community. And so the engineer also may uh, review uh, other documents that are prepared by the 
the developer to um, to make sure that they are in sync which with what they designed. Um, they may do some budgetary preparation of, of different uh, different types of things. One that I could think of in, in terms of um, stormwater uh, in, in New Jersey, at least for new developments, there is a requirement that there uh, that there is an operation and maintenance manual that's put together. And in that operation and maintenance manual is uh, oftentimes a budget uh, or at least maintaining the stormwater facilities on a site. So the develop engineer would be involved in preparing uh, that sort of a maintenance plan and budget. Um, they will oftentimes be um, retained to uh, to oversee the construction and uh, and uh, operating manuals there at the end. Uh, one of the examples I just mentioned was uh, stormwater management operating manuals. Uh, so the develop engineer is in, in a nutshell involved in the design and the pre preliminary prep, uh, preparation of, of documents and reviewing those documents. And uh, just a couple of comments, just by coincidence, yesterday CAI had a um, in-person seminar and I gave a presentation on operating manuals. And operating manuals are something that you're going to see based on these new statutory requirements if they go through that in using a different word, it's going to require a, a, a maintenance plan be part of the governing documents and the disclosures, which is very similar to an operating manual. The other thing is uh, when it says prepare budgetary items, such as reserve study, more and more developers these days don't have their engineer do it. They will hire uh, a reserve specialist to do the reserve study that goes in the governing documents. But not to go off track, most a lot of engineers are afraid to do the reserve study that goes into the governing documents because it comes back to haunt them later on because of the risk of some of the association then saying was underfunded and they get dragged into some kind of a dispute during the transition process. So there's risks in many different directions when you go through this process, which I think are getting less and less based on statutory requirements and things, but they also still do exist. So the association's engineer, the engineer who is preparing the transition and reserve study, um, they're going to prepare those as, as separate documents. Uh, the transition study, the, the, the aim of that transition study and the main purpose is to take the design plans, the approved design plans, and compare what was approved to be constructed to what was actually constructed. Um, so, or actually the opposite of that, to, to look at what's been constructed and visually observe that and compare it to what's been designed. Um, the goal of a reserve study is to uh, give you uh, some budgetary guidance um, as to how much uh, you should be reserving annually to adequately reserve for replacements of the common and the limited common elements if, if the association is responsible for replacement of those limited common elements. So when, uh, when we get involved, when KIPCON as the associ association's engineer gets involved with a transition study, these are the two main documents that we prepare. So when we are performing the transition study, um, as I said, we're comparing what was, what was constructed to uh, what was designed. So that's the first, uh, level of, of inspection we're doing. And as you see in the first bullet point there, we're, we're comparing buildings to the architectural plans that were provided. And we're, preparing, uh, we're, we're comparing the site work to the, to the uh, subdivision or site engineering plans that were provided. Sometimes there's all, there are also written specifications for uh, some of the developments. We also take a look at those, if those are available. Specifications will oftentimes talk about what sort of materials um, are required to be used in the construction and how they're to be installed. Uh, we also look at the governing documents and we're taking a look at what the governing documents um, state that is going to be a, a part of the community. We're, we're making sure that that's, that's actually there. We're taking a look at construction also in terms of workmanship. So this is this is often a um, an area that uh, we wrestle with quite often. Um, 
something can be constructed properly, but it or, or not properly, it can be constructed in a way that it doesn't have, um, a, a, say, a structural deficiency. Uh, an example I use quite often are sidewalks. So the, the contractor comes in and he constructs all the sidewalks in the community and they are made of the concrete they're supposed to be made out of. They're constructed with the proper control joints and, and, uh, and, and blind joints in them that, that are supposed to be there. There's no cracks in them, but they may be aesthetically just, just look very terrible. <laughs> so uh, oftentimes too with, um, with light post installation, all the parts may be there and it may, they may be installed in conformance with what the plans say, but the workmanship on them aesthetically, they're, they just don't compare to what's installed throughout the rest of the community. So oftentimes we'll, uh, we'll point out a workmanship, even though, even though it's constructed in conformance with the plans, meets the specifications, it's in the governing documents, and it doesn't structurally have a problem with it, um, the way something is constructed and the, the way that uh, what people look at every day when, when they, uh, they come out of their units, that's also important and something we look at as part of transition. When we compare it to the construction in other parts of the community that may have been done properly. Um, we also look at manufacturer standards. Um, one good example of that is, is roofs. Um, so, um, are the roofs installed in terms of um, the way that the manufacturers say they should be installed, um, like uh, membrane roofing or shingle roofing? Um, there are standards that the manufacturer has. Another type of manufacturer standard is um, different types of stone veneer. Um, stone veneer is required to be installed in a, in a certain way and have certain clearances above grade in terms of what the manufacturer's state um, the way it should be constructed. Um, another interesting one that I come across uh, a lot lately that's being used on a lot of buildings is what's called the zip system. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a sheathing material that actually has a WRB um, that, that's integral with that sheathing system. And there's a certain way that it has to be installed in a certain way that it has to be, the, uh, the exterior materials have to be flashed when using a zip system. And so the, that's when manufacturer standards become very important because sometimes they point out the way that their particular product should be constructed. Just to, um, just to clarify that WRB means weather resistant barrier. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, weather resistant barriers, like when you look at the side of a building before the siding goes on, a lot of people see the, the trade name Tyvek, which is like a barrier that goes on top of the wood sheathing or whatever is underneath it. The zip system does not have this totally covering that sheathing, but you're taping the joints rather than covering the entire thing. So that's the difference. Uh, but a WRB is a weather resistant barrier. Us engineers have a tendency to talk in, uh, well, we all do, we talk in acronyms without uh, without going into detail about what they mean. But I, we also have, I'm, I'm going to call on them. We got Marshall and George in the audience. We have two attorneys that are being much too quiet. I'm not used to attorneys <laughs> uh, not correcting us. So George and Marshall, did we say anything wrong yet? No, okay. I don't. I don't think you've said anything wrong yet. I'm listening. <laughs> okay, thanks. Well, don't be shy. I, I had to hook up. I had to hook up my camera. Sorry, Rich. Oh, is that George? It's George. So far, so good. Okay, because I, I, as you all know, attorneys like to be engineers. So I thought they would define what WRB is, so we didn't have to. But <laughs> these knows these guys know I like to kid around. But they, we do have two attorneys, Marshall and George, who are experts in this thing, and I just think that. You know they can add some uh, some flavor to the. Hey, Mitch, while while you're while you're chatting at me, I, I wanted to take the opportunity to insert a question that you may have planned on talking about or not. But uh, eventually, I it would be great if you could touch on how the uh, the association's engineer uh, works in tandem or alongside of the township engineer with regard to their inspections and how they impact bond releases and that sort of thing. Yeah, that, that's a, a great question because, uh, you know, sometimes associations rely on the township engineer to do the punch list for the site. 
And uh, in, in many instances, we will ask and, or get a copy of the township's punch list, or in some instances, what we'll actually do is the, the, the association's attorney, and tell me if I'm wrong, George, the association's attorney will reach out to the township and say, we're doing a transition study. Before you release any of the performance bonds, we want you to look at our engineer's study and maybe add some things to your punch list. And I've seen that happen too. So there's, a, but it's a great point because, but don't rely on the township's punch list because it's different from a transition study, but at the same time, you can absolutely work together and it can help you. As a matter of course, I provide a copy of the association's engineer's report to the township so that that can be a second set of eyes uh, to hopefully benefit the township engineer when they're looking at bonds. Yeah, oh, that, that's great. Going. I didn't realize that you actually did that. that that's very good. Yeah. And keep in mind also that I have seen where you go to a, a, a meeting of a town and they're about to release the performance bonds for a developer, where the association gets a group of people to go there, including their attorney and their engineer, and they say, please don't replace, release the bonds yet because we're going through the transition process. And most times they do not release the bonds if you ask them in a public setting like that. So it's, it's, it's important to establish a good relationship and open communication between the association and the township engineer and the other folks down at the township because um, there, there is no legal obligation for the, the town to act based on the desires of the individuals. Their, their obligation is vis-a-vis -vis the, the developer and the bond document, right? But right. they know, if, if the township knows that the, that the residents are interested and would be upset if the bond was released before asking them, that usually helps in the communication process. Yeah, and the key point I think George has said is good relationship. And it's not just good relationship with the town, good relationship with the builder. There's much more likely to come and fix things if you have a good relationship with them rather than call and complain every day. I mean, it's all a matter of communications and things like that. It's very important in terms of the whole process, which we'll touch on expectations in a few minutes. Um, but thanks, and thanks, George. Okay, so there, there are a hierarchy of standards that we look at. We talked about the approved design drawing. So that, that's first and foremost what we're making comparison to. But sometimes the design drawings might be silent on, uh, on certain aspects of the construction um, but there are other standards that we can we can turn to when we're making an evaluation. Um, an important one is uh, are, are the building codes. Um, when we're evaluating different uh, types of building con components in construction, um, the building codes uh, give some very specific guidance on on certain items. Um, a, a big one we look at a lot is uh, is uh, uh, flashing, different types of waterproofing, uh, but there are, there are many different uh, types of uh, or components of the building that the building codes uh, provide specific requirements on. Um, there are also performance standards that are referenced in the building codes um, to how things uh, how things uh, should perform, and, and they make um, specific references to maybe outside. Um, uh, institutions that uh, provide these standards. One of uh, one of them, as an example, is the Brick Industry Association. Um, for the Brick Industry Association provides um, ex uh, extensive technical notes on how brick should be um, constructed and how it should uh, perform and how how it should be flashed and supported and maintained. Um, so we will oftentimes refer to those reference standards in the building code. Um, when we are, when we come across um, areas of the design plans that may be uh, silent on how something should be constructed. Um, another important one is National Association of Home Builders uh, puts out a, a document, publishes a document um, that are regulations governing new home warranties. So it has largely to do with um, the warranties provided uh, by the developer to individual homeowners. And it, they, it goes through and it, it's very specific about what type of defects are the responsibility of the developer and which are not and how they should be remedied. Um, so we will oftentimes turn to that, even though it is that document is specific to um, 
homeowners, we will often reference it in the absence of any other standard. One example is um, is uh, drainage around a building and how it should uh, drain. Even though that that area may be common area, uh, we will um, invoke certain certain portions of uh, the National Home Builders uh, publication. Um, regarding what standards they have for, for drainage around homes. Uh, another standard we might use is manufacturer's literature. And I touched on that earlier. Many, many manufacturers put out very uh, specific um, information on how their product should be constructed and maintained. Um, a, another example I can think of of that would be um, segmental retaining walls. There's Allen block and Keystone block, and they have entire manuals on how their wall should be constructed. And we'll often refer to those if the design drawings are very vague. Um, and then also the National Reserve Study Standards uh, for the Community Associations Institute are what we uh, use as a standard for re the reserve studies that we're preparing. Uh, thanks. And just to, to add a couple of things, and George and Marshall, get ready, because I'm going to put you in a spot in a second with a question. But uh, we talk about the code. Just let's be very clear about what you do as a transition study in regards to the building code. The transition engineer for the association does not go through and check all the architectural drawings and the engineering drawings to see if they were drawn in conformance with the building code. Right. There's building when it goes when they go for building permits, the municipality checks those drawings and looks at them to see and won't issue a, a permit unless they feel they're in conformance with the code. But if we're doing an inspection and we see something that was not built in conformance with the drawings, as part of the transition study, we will then review to see, is it now in conformance with the code or does it violate the code? So I just want to, because some people are under the impression that when you do transition study, we're reviewing the design to see if it's in conformance with the code. In regards to the performance standards, just to clarify or to say that there's two differences. A performance standard is how something performs. A design drawing is how it should be built. So how it should perform is based on, like Melissa said, how long does the water sit there? If there's a leak in the house, it's not meeting the performance. And it may not be performing even if it's built the way the drawings show. So there's two separate things. But here's where I'm, George, if you're still there because you're more in New Jersey than Marshall is, I think, I'm going to put you on the spot. And my understanding is in the regulations governing new home warranties in the state of New Jersey, under the homeowner's warranties, there is something in there that says that it does cover the common elements for two years. So my question would be is, uh, does the homeowner's warranty cover common elements as part of the transition process? And then you may also want to touch on what it means by the election of remedies, because I think that's tied into it too. The, how's that? Yeah, thanks for putting me on the spot. <laughs> I'm sure you're fine. My understanding is 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 your understanding, but it's not as you just uh, talked about. It's not an exclusive remedy. So just uh, the the association can choose to go after um, their own uh, civil claims or the warranty claims. Um, it's different with a homeowner and the homeowner claims against the how warranty, but with regard to the association. Uh, there is not an exclusive remedy. They're not precluded from pursuing both. Now, the reason, just, I know, the reason I asked George is because George is in New Jersey primarily, and in New Jersey, there's a statutory requirement that when you sell a new home, you have to get a home warranty policy. Marshall's in Pennsylvania primarily, and Marshall, if I'm not mistaken, there isn't that same statutory requirement in Pennsylvania. No, but. No, in but. Pens okay. In Pennsylvania, <laughs> the uh, developer is responsible to warrant the common elements for two years. It's not a separate piece of paper, but it's written into the statute. So you do still have that requirement. The problem is that um, the developer may still be in control of the association when the problem arises and may not decide to sue himself or herself. So uh, there's a time limit the law was changed so that the association has a certain amount of time. I don't remember the exact time frame after they take control of the association to bring an action for warranty. So you don't have the problem of 
the uh, developers in control and they run out the statute of limitations. But it is it is a statutory requirement uh, in Pennsylvania as well. I think that's um, actually Pennsylvania took our lead here in New Jersey because we had we pursued legislation uh, like that a couple of years ago as well, which says that the statute of limitations doesn't begin to run until the earlier of either a, a fine, a, discovering the issue or when the residents took control of the board. We're, we're happy I, to learn from you guys, yes. Oh, good. I got a debate going. I like this. <laughs> <laughs> but a question for you. Um, in New Jersey, it's a it's an insurance policy. So if there's a claim, the first thing is my understanding is uh, that if the claim is approved by the insurance company, the insurance company will pay for it to be fixed as opposed to the developer paying for it to be fixed. That's one comment, which I think is the difference. But the other thing is, if I'm not mistaken, tell me if I'm right, the election of warranties, if you're going through transition and you decide to go under the homeowner's warranty policy, then you can't also sue the developer for the same thing because you've decided which, you've made an election of direction you're going to go in. Am I right? Uh, it's, I, I, I can't, I, like I said earlier, I think that that applies to individual claims by individual homeowners, but not to the association. Okay. It's not, and it's not an exclusive remedy for an association. Okay. All right. I'm going to have to double check that, Mitch. All right. Well, we're going to be here for another 20 minutes. So we'll no, I'm not going to do it now. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I don't want to miss anything you're saying. Okay. All right. So now let's get back. Our, Melissa, you're on. Okay. All right. So as I as I mentioned, the uh, the main uh, items that we're preparing when we do a transition study or the, the transition study itself and in, in the reserve study. So um, sometimes there are other services, though, that are required, especially if we find uh, deficiencies in it and depending on how the discussion with the developer progresses. So, um, for example, if we complete a reserve study, or I'm sorry, a transition study gets uh, provided to the developer and the developer responds and there are items in in the um, response that the developer um, does says he's not going to remedy. Um, oftentimes there will be a preparation of a cost estimate and we'll talk that uh, about that a little further on in, in the presentation. But we would prepare a cost estimate for those items. Um, if the developer were to um, were to get through transition without um, without repairing those items, what would the cost to the association be? Um, and you can use that cost estimate in settlement discussions. Um, also, there may be a point at, at which uh, the association may call on their engineer to do a remedial design. Now, I, to be clear, we don't we don't do those for transition study. We don't tell the developer how to fix something. But there may be a point in time where the the engineer is called upon uh, because of the way things are progressing to come up with a remedial design uh, for a deficiency. Um, oftentimes, uh, out of transition comes the question of whether there is moisture getting in. Um, behind um, different facades, or if, uh, say, for example, a retaining wall may have not been constructed uh, correctly, but you can't tell visually uh, what's going on inside the wall of the building or within, within the retaining wall, or say within the roadways, how the roadways are constructed. In that case, we may do some follow-up invasive testing. We may recommend that, and that would be approved by the association to proceed with, uh, but we might do moisture probes in the building. Um, and depending upon what kind of material is in, on the building, it may require some invasive where we take off uh, some stone veneer or perhaps uh, uh, drill into the mortar um, and take the moisture probes and, and, and patch that back up again. Or we may have to do an invasive testing if we need to um, do something a little more comprehensive where we may have to take uh, the facade off of the side of the building or we may have to... Um, dig into the ground to see what's going on. So you're you're having to dismantle something to take a look at it. So we don't do that initially as part of the transition study. We, we do the, a visual observation first. And then if we, we see some deficiencies that we, we would recommend that some follow-up investigation be done, then we might um, recommend some of these moisture probes or some, um, some uh, invasive testing. Um, also, we do meetings and walkthroughs. So Oftentimes when um, the developer uh, comes back and they, they may, based upon what's in the transition study, 
um, or even just in their own, uh, um, own construction completion, uh, may take care of a lot of the items that are identified as uh, deficiencies in the transition study. So before everything is closed out, the association may oftentimes, to, uh, uh, oftentimes ask KIPCON to come back and do a walkthrough, um, oftentimes with the de developer himself um, or a representative of the developer to, um, to take a look at what's been done and whether that um, meets now meets the, um, the expectation of the association or what should have been built. Um, if things get far enough um, along and litigation occurs, we do all also offer uh, litigation support. Um, uh, cost estimates play into that and sometimes further investigation, uh, but that can sometimes also be an offshoot of having a transition study prepared. Okay, so um, all of the all of these elements, um, uh, are interrelated. You've got your governing documents, as I mentioned, define the common elements and the limited common elements, um, and also uh, how they should be maintained. Depending on what those common elements are and the limited common elements would dictate um, how much uh, and the types of maintenance you would uh, need and, and what needs to be reserved for and coming up with a budget to um, to handle those items in, in the form of a reserve study or a preventive, uh, preventive maintenance budget. And you develop the, deve the these budgets and it helps you take care of these things that are defined by your governing documents. So um, Mitch, I'm gonna let you touch on this one because you have a lot of experience uh, with this. Um, the consequential damages are, are when um, one element of the building is not constructed properly. And as a result, other elements of the building become damaged because of the improper construction of, of the first item. And, and Mitch, do you want to elaborate on this a little bit? Yeah, that, that, that's exactly it. If there's a problem with the exterior stone, for example, in this case, and because of the problem with the stone, it causes a problem to something else, and it's a, it's called a consequential damage. Um, so you're tying the damage to the root cause, and it's damage to one part of the building to due to a deficiency in the other. And it's my understanding that when that happens, then the, there's much it's much easier to make an insurance claim for this um, in order to cover it. And when you and when it fixes it, it also replaces the exterior, the the outside part that was built wrong and the inside part. So I, I'm not really going to get into insurance. That's not my expertise, but the definite, that's, that's the definition of consequential damages where damage to one thing consequently damage, or it's one thing being built wrong results in a consequential damage to something else, which we do see a lot of. Right. It's got a bit of a cascading effect. Okay, and Mitch, I'm going to let you. Um, oh no, I'm sorry. This is this is still my part. <laughs> um, okay, so what are what are the risks? What might you run into when when you go through this transition process? We touched upon um, uh, it, having an inadequate budget when we prepare that reserve study, um, and then we take that backward look. Um, sometimes we can see that there was um, an, initially an inadequate uh, reserve statement. So you when associations have already um, purchased their unit when you go through transition, so you're already owners in that. And as Mitch touched on earlier, um, it's different than when you buy a single family home that is not an, an HOA. Um, it's a different sort of a process. So you're already an, an, an owner in the association when you're going through transition. So Mitch also mentioned about homeowners' expectations and what um, what's included in a transition study and the expectation of what we're going to do. So as he mentioned, construction isn't isn't a perfect process. So even though there may might be um, there may be some um, minor um, deficiencies in the construction, it doesn't always mean that it's that there are damages that are realized from that. One of the things that we do, which I think is very valuable, is education is the key to everything. And when generally when we're retained to do a transition study, 
we ask the association about the opportunity to give a presentation to everybody who lives there about what it is. And we talk about what their expectations should be in terms of construction. We talk about the homeowner's warranty. It used to be that we did these in, in person and now it's even gotten better because we do it by Zoom and there are many more people that attend. So people can sit at home and do a presentation like this and hear a seminar similar to this. The other thing I have to mention is that one of the reasons risks are too high or high is because developers have always liked, or a lot of the developers like to hire firms to come and do inspections during construction to see if they're building it right, to keep the, these type of claims from happening. Most engineers will not do that anymore because they get third partied into transition claims and it's a huge risk for them. So the developers are caught in kind of a catch 22. They wanna build it right. They want somebody to look at it while it's being built but nobody will be doing it because too much risk. So it, it's, a, it's a problem. Right. Okay, I'm gonna move quickly through this because we, we only have a couple of minutes left. So um, there may be different types of uh, deficiencies that we find. Um, one of them is um, inadequate detailing of, of critical areas. And these are areas where water uh, can get into the building. They're not flashed properly, um, or, or if the uh, design drawings are silent on how they should be flashed and, and the contractor um, builds it in a certain way that is, is improper, water can get into those areas. So detailing of, of areas that are prone to water infiltration are very important. We, we look at those areas uh, pretty closely. Um, we talked about as-built construction that doesn't match the design plans. Um, so we're, we're making comparison as to the location and how things should be constructed. Um, also unclear detailing of criti critical areas, um, you know, areas that like kick out flashing on roofing or, um, or uh, uh, clearance of uh, facade materials above the foundation. These are areas that are critical to how a building performs. So we look very closely at that. And just to uh, quickly tell you, and by the way, I broke the Mitch rule because the Mitch rule is start on time and end on time, but I made a big mistake of asking Marshall and George to talk. So it's their fault. We're going to go over. If you have to leave, this is going to be recorded, but it, as usually it's legal counsel's fault, <laughs> but that's all right. So, but if you have to leave, blame the, the lawyers, of course, I, I didn't know you were there. So I didn't think you heard me. <laughs> uh, so, and I put my email, I'm sorry, Mitch, I put my email address in the chat box. It's uh, jsmallwood at kipcon.com if you need any CEU credit. CEU credit is what we like to link to the video of this. But uh, one thing I want to mention here is where as-built construction is not much design charge. This shows how there's a connection and understanding the interrelationships. For example, the design drawings did not show this retaining wall. It was just sloped into the woods. The developer said, I'm going to put in the retaining wall so they have more of a usable backyard. So what happens? They have a more of a usable backyard, but it's a safety issue because now kids can run and fall off that retaining wall. But the other thing is that retaining wall was not shown in the additional reserve study. The reserve study wasn't updated. And now the, the association is going through the transition process and they're saying the developer's reserve study is inadequately funded because this retaining wall isn't included. So it goes to show that good guys don't, don't always finish first where they're trying to do something to make it more usable, but it runs into a problem later on. And I think Melissa, you touched on these already. Yeah, I, I did. We touched on, uh, yeah, we touched on all of these before. So and one thing I just want to point out at the bottom right-hand corner, very common, you have a site plan that's done and so the water drains away by putting a sloped area between the buildings. But then the buildings aren't high enough and you have all these downspouts coming down between the buildings that dump a huge amount of water there and there's no way for the water to get away, out of there. So it becomes a problem because you'll have standing water in there much longer than the performance standard of 24 hours. So this is because of the, the no coordination between the architectural and engineering plans in terms of how high to put the buildings and where the downspouts go. I think we talked about this yeah, already. We touched on these. Uh, I think yes, we, we, talk, we talked about these. Yeah, I think we did that. Yeah, we, we talked about those. Okay. All right, and, and we, we also touched on this. Um, 
you know, in a, in a perfect world, uh, you know, you're not going to find construction deficiencies. I don't know that I've ever gone through a transition study where we didn't find something. Um, sometimes things are quite minor. Um, something times the, the deficiencies are egregious and it, and it requires a little more, um, uh, you know, time and effort to get through that transition. Um, and as Mitch mentioned, the developer didn't set out to build it wrong on purpose. Um, they want to give the, the homeowner a quality product so that they um, uh, speak well of them and they are, uh, they are able to, um, to sell more of what they do. Right. So this is also part of uh, keeping a uh, keeping um, a good relationship with the developer. So um, we try to be very objective um, on on how things are constructed. So, um, you know, even though something might not match the design plans, we, we may look to see if it, it if it's something that's equivalent. Uh, and again, you're looking to see, you know, what, what are the damages to the community and not having constructed this uh, according to the plan? So if it's not constructed according to the plans and something uh, uh, negative is happening, like water getting into the building or, or something to that effect, um, that's um, that's something that we would definitely um, uh, focus on in a transition study. But if there is a replacement in, in kind of a material and it's performing um, reasonably the same, um, that might not be something that we, we would point it out, um, but that might not be something that we would um, focus on very, very intensely. And the objective word is critical because most good builders, if you show them something that's wrong and you tell them what the standard is and you're objective about it, will fix it or do something. I've seen many cases, you know, and I've seen a lot of engineering reports and you know, in some cases, the things are pushed towards um, a problem based on the way they're presented. And when you're hiring somebody to do a transition study, you know, one of the logical questions I would ask is, how many of your transitions have had ended up in litigation? And if 90% of them have, you don't want to go in that direction. So litigation is the worst thing that can happen. Right. I think this is where I jump in, right? Yep, Listen. I'm going to turn this back over to you, Mitch. All right, so I'm going to go through some of this kind of quick because we've talked about a lot of it, but how do you actually evaluate the claim? Uh, typical ways to resolve is the developer will come in and correct the problem. Maybe there's cracks in the sidewalks or a problem with the roads. Will it make a cast contribution for reduced use for life in the reserve study? Or will say, here's the money, you go fix it, which is what I think most developers would want to have happen because if they correct the problem and it doesn't work again, they may still be on the hook. But if they give you the money to fix it, then they're off the hook, they gave you money. And like I said, the contribution to the reserve fund. But I'm working on a transition right now where there's a combination of these things going on. The developers can do some corrections, they're gonna make a cash contribution, and they may make a contribution to the reserve fund. So well, it depends on the situation, but there's a lot of ways to do it. Very important that when you're soliciting a transition study, you can't imagine how many times somebody will call us up and say, we have this community, we want you to do a transition study, but they don't tell us what they want. So you have to make sure, and I'm going to go into it in a second, what you should ask for when you're getting a, a transition study, such as there should be a list of all the deficiencies. For each deficiency, there should be a description of what the deficiency is, what the standard is, design detail, code, manufacturers, all the stuff Melissa spoke about. And if you give that to the developer in a format like a punch list, in many cases, the developer will just come back and this is the response. They'll agree with it, they'll correct it. They don't agree with it for whatever reason it is. They couldn't find it, which then will result in a walkthrough and the engineer will show them where the problem is. And like Melissa just said, you know, maybe the answer is it's it may be slightly different, but it's equivalent. And sometimes I have to tell you, I've seen it where not only is it equivalent, but what the developer did is actually better. I see this right. a lot with landscaping where they may not follow the landscaping plan, but they put in more landscaping because they want the community to look better. So uh, as long as it's a very objective report, there's much less likelihood of confrontation. There's some strong claims and there's weak claims. For example, if uh, going to the weak, if it's a deviation, it's equivalent. I just said that minor drainage. You have a puddle that's there for more than 24 hours. Are you going to sue about that? What's the damage? Strong deviation from the design. If it's not equivalent, safety issues results in water or other damage. You really have to evaluate what the strength of the claim is. And I warn associations, do not do a cost estimate until you've given the report to the developer and you see what the response is. 
Because as soon as you give a cost estimate of the things that are wrong, then there's going to be an expectation that the developer is going to write you a check for that amount of money. Show them the report, let them respond to it. But then if they say we won't fix anything, then you want to have a cost estimate done to evaluate, should we fix it for $20,000 or should we sue them for $200,000? And you can make a business decision. But the cost estimates scare me to do right up front until you see what the developer is saying. All right, here we go, cost estimate. This is just an example of something we worked on a few years ago. And this was a, in this case, there was a claim. I, I, I just taught unrealistic expectations. I'll be prepared. I, I, I just jumped ahead. We talked about the transition team, the, the dangers. Here's the dangers. This is a real life scenario. It was a $9 million claim. The association filed suit against the developer. The developer retains legal counsel, expert reports, blah, 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 24 subcontractors, all the report claims to the insurance company. And I have been in depositions where there's 30 people sitting there. So what happens is, that the association's cost involved in this was a million and a half for legal expenses, engineering expenses came to $3 million in total expenses for a $9 million claim. Okay, but now the developer cost comes to uh, $5.5 million for depositions and all kinds of things. So the bottom line is if you add it up, the cost for the association and the developer and defense cost and uh, plaintiff cost came to about the same amount as the claim itself. So there really has to be some logical thinking and business thinking about these things and how you get to a resolution. Because as soon as you get into litigation, I promise you it's gonna cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and you don't wanna go there. Some of the strategies, um, negotiation, mediation. Well, I've been involved in a couple of transitions recently where instead of, you know, you have the attorneys involved in coordinating things, but they've let the engineers, they've let me meet with the engineer on the other side, whether it's the developers, the associations, and the engineers meet on site, go over the reports, they come up with something. And most of the times what I have found that when the engineers meet together to come up with some kind of conclusions, it doesn't end up in litigation and there's a there's a, a amicable settlement and the things are, are, are taken care of. So you may wanna consider that. I've seen that just recently on, on, on a number of transitions where the attorneys have said, okay, let the engineers meet. I've also been in rooms where the engineers are there and there's three or four attorneys and they're just meeting and talking about it and everybody has to posture themselves in a certain way so you really don't have a productive conversation. Um, cutting edge for the developers, essentially the same type of thing, discussion um, and education. Education is, is very important. So uh, there are ways, and again, I'll, I'll keep saying, the worst thing you want is um, to have litigation. Again, I mentioned you should have an RFP when you're selecting an engineer to do your transition study. Tell them that you want the locations, what the standard is. Is it a deviation from drawings, working the code equivalency, but list it. I know there's a lot of text and there's a lot of pictures, but I hate to say it, the most important part of that study in my mind is a spreadsheet that says the locations, the problem, and the standard. Mm -hmm. And that really summarizes everything. Invasive testing. I want to talk about this. This is some cutting edge strategies. Here, in order to find this water behind the wall, you take it apart. But there's some new technology out there, which we use all the time. It's called thermographic evaluations, where, oh, let's see, um, this thing went forward. I didn't want it to. But where we can use uh, infrared cameras. And rather than taking it apart, we can tell where there's moisture behind the facade. For example, this, uh, all right, well, I think you got the idea. This is it's a life of its own now. It wants me to stop talking. But uh, you can see where with infrared cameras, you can see where moisture is behind facades, under roofs. It's a great technology. We use it all the time and it gets away from doing any type of invasive testing as a starting point. Expectations, no such thing as perfect construction. Didn't build it right on purpose. If the process is guiding non-confrontational way, it'll mostly start, end up non-confrontational. Keep in mind, there are major construction defects that you're running to. There are situations where you have to run and end up in litigation to solve it. But I would say that the vast majority of transitions can be settled um, in a good way without running into litigation. A lot of it, don't get me wrong, has to do with the developer in terms of where they want to go with it, where they want to end up. But a lot of it has to do with the association also in terms of the expectations and how you treat the developer and, ex and your expectations of what they're going to do 
and you just got to keep it, uh, you know, a, a nice relationship. But sometimes you do end up in getting litigation. There's no question about it. Here's a reference library. This is, uh, if anybody wants any of these, uh, let us know. The left, there's the best practices report on transition. Reserve study standards just came out. CAI just came out with the maintenance best practices report. This reserve funding book, uh, which you see there's a great author of it down there, uh, that you'll have to buy from CAI, but there's some great publications and things there, uh, that are out there. Now, if you have any questions, but I, I, but I do want to, if you don't mind, just for a couple of seconds, I also want to show you some other great technology that's out there. And feel free to drop off, but I, I think we've only lost three people, so we're doing good. I want to show you the uh, what we use a lot of, which is um, another technology, which is this. And I'm going to, sh this is, here we go. This is, we do use drone technology for everything that we do. This is a community where we drone the entire community. And let's see, why isn't it showing the entire thing? All right, Malvern Crossing, where did it go? Uh, I want to show you this, because, uh, but this is the projects we work on that we have, we use drone technology for, let's see. And this is the software we input all the information into, you know, I'll go up here, Malvern. And the reason I want to show you this one here it is, this is a community that we're involved in transition right now. Now, what we did is we droned the entire community and it doesn't want to work for me. Let's see. Well, <laughs> what we can, uh, I don't know why it's not working. Um, all right, well, here, here it is. This is the community. What we do is we have a flight pattern. You can see it, these green lines are where the drone flies back and forth. It takes pictures at a million, a lot of different spots. And then what we do is, here it is. This is the community. We drone it. Yeah. Mitch, you're it's not sharing community. anything. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Thank you very much. Well, good. So you didn't see that it wasn't working. Now it is. All right. So here's a community. You can all see it now. We did a transition study for this community right here. It's called Malvern Crossing. So we droned it. We fly back and forth. And in this case, we took 836 photos which is all then stitched together into what you see. We do this for just about every transition study we do now. So what we can do is we can now zoom in and we can look at the roofs of the buildings. We can look at the drainage. We can look at everything with spectacular resolution. So, but if we take it a step further. So this one, then what we do is the question is, for example, where the, was the landscaping installed where it should be? For example, when you look down, you see trees here. Now, was that installed the way the plans show it? So I go into the overlays, and in the overlays, I have in here the landscape plan. So now you see what's happened? We have the landscape plan in the background. So now if I zoom in, this is the actual plan of how it was supposed to be built. These circles are showing where the trees should have been, and you can compare directly where they were where they are versus where they should be. And of course, it, it needs to be equivalent, but um, you know, like we talked about, but this is a technology used all the time. Now let's stop the landscape plan and let's look at the grading plan. We say there's drainage problems in the community and you see what's going on in the background. You're seeing a plan that shows how the community should have been graded so that the water flows. So we're showing the grading plan and we see how the water should flow. Now let's watch this, I go back and I say elevation, I click this button, and what you're gonna see in a second is you see the colors? That color is the elevation of the ground. So we can now compare the way it was supposed to be sloped to the way it was actually sloped because you look over here, you see the different elevations. And now I can look and see that. Now, if I take out the elevation and I zoom in, I can also see where, look at, I'll show you an example here. Here, there was supposed to be a catch basin installed. See the catch basin was installed? You can see it in the picture. This is where it's supposed to be about a foot away. Now it's in the right spot, don't get me wrong, because you have to evaluate the information. But I wanna show you the type of technology that is used now because we've used the overlays in this case that we used were the grading plan for the drainage, the landscape plan for the uh, landscaping, and then the site plan to show, for example, you're going to see it in a second, where the buildings should be and things like that. But my point is, 
that we completely, when you do a transition study, we walk the entire site, we look at every, we can also use um, cameras that have thermographic or infrared cameras on the drones where we can see if there's water under the shingles. We can also see if the vents, I don't know why it's not, um, you, oh, here we go. We can see if the ventilation in the roofs are working by by the infrared cameras because it tells if the heat is coming out of the, uh, the attics. Now here, this is the site plan behind it. So you can see it's showing where the building should be and it's showing where they are. But I just wanted to show you this as uh, you can, this is spectacular, spectacular technology we use on all the transition studies we do because we can now go back to the office uh, which we do and take out these plans and show exactly where problems are. We can zoom in, but we do walk the entire site and then con confirm the issues. For example, if you go close up around some of these catch basins, you can see standing water. If you go to the drawings that are behind it, you'll see that it's not sloped right. And then if you do that, um, that top topography that I just showed you, it'll show, it'll confirm that the plans are not right. So with all that said, we've gone 18 minutes over. And I see that in the chat room, there might be, um, <laughs> I thought maybe you would say Mitch, stop talking, but uh, there are some questions here. If uh, Is there a code word we should include in the email? Um, yes, Jody, what is it? Any code word to get to CEUs? Just, oh, here's what you do. Just tell what I talked about just now, the drones. Just use the word drone, which means you're here at the end and you'll get to CEUs. Um, please discuss benefit derived to the developers part of transition. What benefit derived means is it's a budgetary term, and it essentially means that when you do a reserve study for the original governing documents, it's based on full occupancy. Everything was built at once based on the plans and that type of thing. Benefits derived essentially means in, is that you go back and you look at the reserve study to determine if it's adequate by taking into account when things were actually built. For example, if the original reserve study includes all of the roads, but some of the roads weren't built until three or four years later, you really don't start funding for those roads until they were built. Or the other way to look at it is you start funding based on when units close. There's a few different ways to define benefits derived, but it's a good way and it's used uh, to determine if a reserve study is not adequate uh, based on when things were actually built. So that's benefits derived. If you look in the New Jersey statutes, and if you want, I can send you a copy, it actually defines in their benefits derived now how to use it in terms of evaluating reserves and underfunding. All right. Is there statute of limitations for structural issues found on a home after developers gone HOAs in charge? The, um, if you look at the performance uh, warranties, which we talked about now, especially in New Jersey, because it's statutory, and uh, even the, the regulations going to new home warranties is based on structure for 10 years. Punch list items, for example, like na nail pops and these type of things and water leaks are for one year. Uh, mechanical systems like heating systems, air conditioning systems are warrantied under this for two years. Major structural defects are um, up to 10 years after closing on the unit. But my suggestion is, especially in New Jersey, because when you closed on a unit, you got a copy of the homeowner's warranty. Looking there, it's a performance standard and very clearly defines what's the problem, what's the standard, and what the developer responsibility is. And it's very clear in there what is meant by a structural uh, deficiency. So take a look in there. Um, but as far as the statute of limitations, other than the homeowner's warranty, I'm going to defer that uh, to George and Marshall if they're still here to touch on that, because I'm just talking based on the homeowner warranty. Um, you asked us, Mitch. Oh, uh, Marshall, by the way, the transition meeting with the owners is extremely helpful. I think it's great to set expectations. Oh, George, great job, Mitch and Alyssa. Okay, I'll read that out loud. All right, thanks, great work. All right, but um, so the, does anybody have any other questions? I think I touched on all, I, re I responded to all of them. No, all right, well, thank you very, everybody for attending today. If you need continuing education units, uh, email me, Joey, or Melissa. Joey's probably the better one because then it goes to her directly anyway. And uh, have a great day and thank you very much. You'll be getting an announcement of our next seminar, which is coming up, webinar, which is coming up in the next couple of weeks. Thank, thank you. you. Have a great Bye, day. Everyone. Thanks, Mitch. Bye.